Good evening. I'm Harold Holzer, and I have the privilege of serving as director of Roosevelt House, and on behalf of Hunter President Jennifer Rabb, and all of us at Hunter who are celebrating the 150th anniversary of Hunter College, we welcome you to Roosevelt House. Um, so Roosevelt House may not be the home of the most prolific presidential writer, um, but as our special guest Craig Furman points out in his new book, Franklin Roosevelt was at least one of the most avaricious presidential readers. And we'll get to talk a little bit about this, or at least he says one of the most persistent book collectors, right? We hope he read some of them. Um, certainly before he moved into the White House. And um, so much of the New Deal history, which fills books, was crafted and originated in his actual library, right upstairs, that we feel we have a call on uh, Craig's attention and, and yours for this, for this discussion. And remember, this is also Eleanor Roosevelt's house, um, to the point that she felt secure enough to call it that, and you've all heard me talk about Eleanor's relationship to her mother-in-law and to this home. Um, but her uncle Teddy gets comprehensively covered in Craig's book as both a reader and a writer. So the book, as you can see, from the slide above me, is author-in-chief. A great title, isn't it? It's perfect. The Untold Story of Our Presidents and the Books They Wrote. I think the title has a double meaning, um, for me at least. It signifies not only that uh, the authors were presidents, but if you're an author-in-chief, the implication is for some of them they had a little help. Did you think that as well? I didn't make that connection until just now, but I, I totally buy it. I have, a, I have a sinister uh, sense of these things. Anyway, this book has already generated terrific reviews, significant attention, as it should, because um, it's amazing that it hasn't been written before, but it is original, it's sweeping, it's beautifully written, and its author-in-chief, its only author, is Craig Furman, who has written for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and is here at Roosevelt House tonight to discuss his very first book. So welcome, Craig. So here's the drill, as you all know, um, who, for those of you who have not been here before, and I'm, a lot of familiar faces, of course, we'll talk for a bit, and then we will have a time, uh, time for you to answer questions. No, I will answer questions. You can ask questions. <laughs> Don't answer questions is what I should have said. Um, and then we will all retire. Um, as you can see, I'm pretty close to it myself. We'll all retire upstairs for um, a reception and a celebration and a book signing where we can toast Craig Furman and get copies of his book. Please, those of you who walk around with uh, mobile devices, please make sure they're off because we are recording this for the benefit of our students and uh, for um, a video that can live on the Roosevelt House website. And we hope your family is watching in Indiana, too. Right? I hope they are. If not, right. they'll definitely check out the replay. OK. <laughs> so before we dive in, let me just share my overall impressions of the book. Um, because I think it's not only a definitive book about presidential book writing, it's and a history of presidential politics, by the way, but it's um, it's about presidential education, about the idea of writing, about ghost writing, about the evolving culture of American writing and reading, about the economics and marketing of publishing, uh, printing, and book selling. So everything from hot type to whatever we have now, I'm not even sure, from um, mail orders to independent bookstores to Barnes and Noble to Amazon, um, it, the Book of the Month Club, the inauguration of paperbacks, all covered just wonderfully. And that's aside from the main story. And I just want to throw that in for those of you who are interested in a sweeping look at the whole evolution of the reading culture in America. Craig provides, uh, provides that. And um, along the way, he talks about memoirists who are not presidents, everyone from 
and, and writers who make a big impact on the culture, from James Fenimore Cooper to Harriet Beecher Stowe, um, Richard Wright, Babe Ruth. Everyone makes an appearance. Um, so it's a history of American bestseller lists, American busts in, in books. Um, and I found that aspect um, fascinating. So now that I've done my little fan letter, um, what brought you to this topic and how long did it take you? Sure. That's always of interest to our, our attendees. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. This is a dream come true, and, and thank you all for coming tonight. It means a lot to, to be able to talk with you about these books and, and to be able to talk with you as well. Um, so the idea, believe it or not, started back in 2008, which means I was working on this book for more than 10 years, which is a surprise to a lot of people. It was a surprise to me it took this long, but that, that, that current you talk about, the publishing culture, the history of bestsellers, the history of bookstores, you couldn't tell this story without telling that context, and it took a lot of work to be able to figure out that context, in addition to all the new discoveries about specific presidents in their own lives. Um, so in 2008, I was in grad school, uh, but I was really spending more time following the election that year, because I'm sure you all remember, it was a wonderful election, really exciting election, and books were at the center of things in that election. Um, John McCain's books are one example, but really it was Barack Obama's books that, that first uh, gave me this idea and, and gave me this curiosity, because I saw his books were everywhere. I saw that readers and voters were really responding to these books, and they were really good books. And so I just got curious. I said, well, is this the first time this has happened? Has there been other examples where a book changed the world, where a book changed a career, where a book changed a person who was running for president? And so the next year was when I really started to dig in. And like you said, nobody has written this book before. So I had to start in about the most boring way possible, which was going to libraries and making lists. But once I started making those lists, I realized that you know the first presidential memoir was written by John Adams. And the first campaign book, like what Obama's and McCain's were, that a book that helped somebody run for office, was written by Thomas Jefferson. So this history, is, is American history, it's as old as American history itself. And so once I realized the kind of depth of that story, I was like, well, there's really something to tell here. And I started digging in kind of in 2009, and you know, 10 years later, here we are. Well, you, you hung in, which is good. Um, Barely sometimes, <laughs> but yes. But you also had a family during this period, so you were otherwise engaged in, I know you have young children. And yeah, Henry and Maisie, if you guys are watching, <laughs> right. you gotta go to bed soon, so. <laughs> Well, there's an hour time difference, right? Um, were you, I mean, so this is a per kind of a personal question. Were you worried at all? This happened to me twice um, along the years, and it's very upsetting. Were you worried that someone might come along and do this book or a book? I was a little bit at first, but then when I saw how much work it would take to do it well, I stopped worrying about it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that sounds glib, but it's true. Like, I mean, the amount of work it takes to understand how the Sears Roebuck catalog works and why that really changed what readers who lived in the middle of the country could read or how hard it was to deliver books on horseback, again, setting aside all the changes in the presidency and campaigning, it, it, it took a lot of work. It was a real passion project, and so I, I was confident that I was the only person crazy enough to go yeah. through with it. I'm not saying everyone would have done it the way you did it. They might have just raced through a chronology, so, um, and, and Craig has the ability to, um, um, to digress in the book, but keep, the, keep all the balls in the air, juggling them very nicely. So you Thank get this publishing story, you get the political and story. And I, I think it's important, too, to say that there's a real story here, too, and that, that's one reason I wanted to take my time, because presidents read other presidents. John Adams was reading Thomas Jefferson's book, or a young Ronald Reagan was reading Calvin Coolidge's book. And so when you see those kinds of moments, first of all, it makes the president seem human because they were readers like the rest of us, but it also shows how central these books were to American culture for so long and, and still are, with Obama being a great example. So there's a real story here that even if you know, you know the biggest elections like 1800 or 1860, you don't know everything because these books were central in, in their own times and those kinds of digressions help sort of show how important the books were. And as you remind people just doing a minute on Lincoln, because we sort of agreed that we wouldn't because we have so many other people to talk about. Lincoln gets to, uh, to uh, Trenton and talks about reading Weems' Life of Washington. It's not an autobiography or a memoir, but, pre, but future presidents reading about past presidents is impactful, and you do cover that. So I think the, the, the way that Craig divided the chapters or divided the 
the kinds of books with which he deals is, is helpful. Um, there are, as you pointed out, campaign books or pre-presidential books. You think most of them were intended as to set up future campaigns. There are um, just books that people write because they're, they're writers. We'll get to those. And then memoirs, which you call legacy books. Some are guilty of all of the above, right? We haven't seen President Obama's legacy book yet, but it's certainly coming. Um, so let's, let's indeed set the table with the early examples. Um, Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia and how he worked both in France and in the United States to get that published and why. I mean, we know it basically today as the book that has terribly offensive things about African Americans um, that have further haunted Jefferson's reputation in terms of racial matters. But he had a, a vision for it, right? That's right. It's a book that um, definitely has those passages that you're talking about. And one thing I try to do in my book is show that Jefferson cared about this book the way only a book lover could, and that it was really important to him to publish the book and to control every aspect of the book. I mean, he cared about the map that folded out of the book. He cared about the font for the book. And so because he cared about all those things, I think that puts the, the comments you were talking about about black people in a new light, because not only are they, um, well, not only were they offensive even in their own time, but they were exactly the way Jefferson wanted them to be. Um, but that, that's a small part of the book. Um, the, the book says, is called Notes on the State of Virginia, but it's really a book about America because it's a book that he wanted to defend America's reputation and defend it on kind of an international stage. And the book was an enormous success on that front. It's, it's maybe a book that not a lot of people have heard of today, but by any standard is one of the two or three most important books that any American wrote in the 18th century. I'm not talking about presidents, I'm just talking American authors. And it was a book that not only in its arguments, uh, sort of defending America's literary culture and its scientific culture, but just in its existence by the fact that it was such a wonderful book and such a well-received book, it, it proved that America could compete on this international stage after the Revolutionary War. And Adams and the Federalists who read it admired it as well, right? Because it, it was a, a pain to American civilization. They admired it until the election of 1800, right. and then it became a, the best weapon to use against Jefferson. So Adams had a different way of going about things, right? And not, not as successfully. Tell us a little bit about that, because the contrast between Jefferson and Adams is always interesting. Sure. Well, one thing I like about looking at presidents as they write is I feel like it's a chance to really see the human side of them, because when you have to sit down and, and put what you're thinking or what you're feeling into words, that, that, that extra step, and, and this is true for any of us who are writing an email or a letter or anything else, that extra step really causes you to think and, and, and slow down. And so you can see that in Jefferson and Adams. Jefferson, as I mentioned, was, was kind of a control freak. He was somebody who had a specific vision for the book and wanted to make sure everything was exactly in order. Adams was the complete opposite in temperament, which means he was the complete opposite as a writer. Um, he hated to revise. He would talk about how I just, you know, I, I can't even slow down to write. I've just got to get it all out. He, he talked about how writing was so hard for him that it felt like a blow to the knee, which I definitely thought about that line a lot in the 10 years. <laughs> uh, my knees are still functioning, but barely. Um, but that, that tells you something about how they write differently, but that also tells you something about how different they are as, as people, because Adams was very emotional and very impulsive. And while that made it hard for him to write, I also think that made his book revolutionary because he was so much more personal in his legacy book than many presidents even writing today. And, and it, it was hard to write an autobiography in the early 19th century. And it was really hard to write something personal where you talked about you know, who you loved or what your children were like. These books were often very stately and, and focused on the public role. And so I think the reason John Adams could write about his personal life was just because he was a very emotional person. And that showed up in the way he wrote the book, but also in what he wrote as well. And, and speaking of legacies, he also had a son who was helpful, and and John Quincy had a son who was helpful in perpetuating the legacies and books of their of the writings of Abigail and John. So all of this is like a triple whammy of legacy that Adams gets the benefit of. Writings of Jefferson doesn't quite have that impact with the diary, even with the diary, right? That's right. And the the fact that Adams's grandson is editing the books just sets all that up. Although we should note that. Um, Abigail Adams's book of letters in the 1840s actually outsold John's, but um, <laughs> John would just say that's another example of the world not appreciating his talents, but I would say it's just an example of Abigail being amazing. Right. 
So the Jackson part is fascinating because for the first time in this, in this uh, litany of presidents, early presidents who are attending to their legacies, Jackson is wealthy enough and has the kind of loyalty out there to attract, if not ghostwriters, at least people to help um, going out to Tennessee to his retirement home. But it wasn't always easy, right? I think he, what, he had Lib 3 collaborators. It's absolutely right. It's it's probably, it has to be one of the most grisly tales in American publishing because his first ghostwriter was a very accomplished historian who was also a doctor. And so he testified in court that somebody was mentally unwell. Um, and I think he was right because when that person got out of prison, he shot him in the back and killed him. So that's that's one ghostwriter down. We have more. The second ghostwriter was um, somebody who served with Jackson and was his aide de camp and traveled with him, knew him, was ready to write the book, and things seemed to be going great, so he went back to visit his family, woke up feeling a little bit sick, was dead 24 hours later. Yeah. And so at this point, and, and again, I think this kind of shows that human side, um, Jackson still really wants to finish the book. Because he wants it to make money to help the widow and the young children of, the, of this aide who died, but also because he's already starting to think about you know, how do I control my life story? How do I make sure, because he, he was a celebrity at that time, and so there are a lot of attempts, you know, what is the frontier? What are famous generals like? There's a lot of gossip and, and cultural excitement around them, just like there would be today. So the book was the way to shape that. So he found a third writer. Uh, this writer was able to finish the book in one piece, uh, both for the book and for the writer himself. And so they finished the book, um, but, but Jackson was so intimately involved. It, it, when you think about their relationship in terms of the way modern presidents like Harry Truman worked on their book, you know, if, if Harry Truman had his own book, Andrew Jackson had his own book too, because he chose the writers, he wrote memos, he was reviewing every page, he was doing sitting for interviews. And so that book, while a biography of Jackson, is, is really a book of Jackson's as well. And anyone who has read his letters, as I know you have, know he was a very good writer and had, you know, frontiersman and uh, bloody Andrew that he may have been, he knew classical references, he knew dramatic, and he was a very good writer. But. Yeah, I actually found some letters in Jackson's hand that nobody had seen before, and they, they capture exactly what you're talking about. He sent these letters to the person who was the best publisher in America at that time, so the person who was publishing James Fenimore Cooper and Washington Irving and other literary celebrities at that time. But Jackson wanted his book to be a hit because he thought it would help him run for office. And so he contacted this editor and, and you know, was very smart in flattering the editor and saying, you know, that this is really a book that will work for you. This is how many copies we know we can sell. And so when I found those letters, I, I, was, I loved them because they showed that literary side of him, but I also couldn't quite believe that nobody had seen them before. So I, I contacted the Andrew Jackson papers. And so this is, I think they're up to 17 volumes now in chronological order, all of Jackson's letters. And so I sent them an email and I said, is this, you know, these were in the publisher's archives. Could these possibly be Jackson letters you guys don't have? And the response, the email just came back almost immediately. Ugh, this yeah. is what keeps me up at night. Because now they have to put these two letters from 1816 all the way at in the end. In an addendum, yeah. Right. But there's an online edition, exactly. so I'm sure they're very grateful. Even if they said ugh. They yeah, were, at the time, ugh, but you know, with, right. with the passage of time, hopefully. So um, Craig did something very clever. Mm -hmm. I'll just allude to it quickly because we, we want to move on to the Roosevelt era as well but of particular interest to me because I write about Abraham Lincoln, he um, considered a project that Lincoln undertook after he lost the Senate race in Illinois to Stephen Douglas. Uh, he, he put it in this list as a campaign book, which it was, but in the, in the, um, the context of the other campaign biographies, it's not quite an autobiography, but tell everyone briefly about how you, how you looked at this Lincoln project. One of the biggest surprises for me working on the book was that if we think about who was the first American presidential candidate to, to assemble a book with their own words to help them run for office, which is what every presidential candidate does today, right? Like if you see in the news, oh, somebody's working on a book, your, your next thought is, I'll bet they're getting ready to run for president. But you know, there are antecedents like Jefferson who wrote his book a long time before he ran for office and then the book came up and mattered when he, when he eventually ran. There are antecedents like Andrew Jackson who you know, needed his book to look like a biography to kind of create this shield where he could be involved with the book but not in public because it was a little bit dangerous to be a writer, especially if you wanted to run for president because running for president was just a much different enterprise in the 19th century than it is today. If, if you were the kind of person who went out there and said, here are my ideas, please vote for me, 
that was proof that you were not the right person for the job because there was just a desire for you know civil servants and, and somebody who would be called to called to by their fellow citizens to run even though they behind the scenes were of course doing a lot of stuff and so Lincoln behind the scenes was was the first person to gather his own writings and, and put them into a book um, and he he was obsessed with it. I mean, he when you look at the number of letters he sent and received, when you look at how carefully he worked in putting together these transcripts of their yeah, debates. Yeah, tell everyone what, what the book was. I don't think I said I set it up properly. That's okay. That's okay. Um, so 1858, Lincoln runs for Senate. He loses. Um, during that election, there are the famous debates that we all know of and, and have heard of even today between him and Douglas. And so there was there was an innovation during this um, during this time period where re newspapers were starting to send um, stenographers to take down you know the best transcripts they could get of the debates to try to get what each side said. And this was new enough that somebody like Douglas didn't really see the power of it. So he would repeat himself to the point that sometimes the stenographers would stop listening because they knew they could just rewrite what they had written at the previous debate. Um, but Lincoln, he just intuited how powerful print could be, I think because it was so powerful to him as a young man. You mentioned him reading that biography of Washington, and there are so many other stories where books really opened up a new world to Abraham Lincoln living in Indiana. And so because of that, I think he understood that, that books could help him in his political journey as well. And so he gathered these newspaper transcripts, which today it seems easy. You know, you could Google it, you could look it up. But in 1858, it was difficult to get these transcripts, and he needed multiple copies, not just of different newspapers because he wanted to pick the best versions, but also of each edition because he carefully cut them up and pasted them in a book. So, a very so he actually he got three of each right. from the Chicago Tribune and the Chicago Times. And another outlet as well. He wanted to hold one co one full copy for the record and then snipped away. So he was very clever. Yeah, and so he put About that. And he did cut them himself because if you look at other Lincoln documents, he, for some reason, loves to cut things out very carefully. He's a very good yeah. cutter. Yeah. <laughs> Talented with a razor, among many other skills. Um, so, but, I mean, I just love the idea of, you know, we don't know exactly how he put the book together, but whether it was scissors, whether it was a razor, you know, an old newsprint like that, the ink's going to stain your fingers, the pages are brittle. But he was careful. You're right. He used a pencil to make the smallest corrections you could think of because he wanted the text to be accurate, because he, he believed in fairness, and he believed in his words, presenting his belief on you know this enduring question of slavery and whether or not it should expand. So he puts together the scrapbook. He finds a printer, which is kind of its own saga, because he's a very demanding author, as you might imagine. Um, but he finally finds a printer who's going to do it. And the book sold 50,000 copies by the time he was elected. Yeah, you've upped the estimate a bit, so it's interesting that you've done that, because we used to say 30, but I'm going to take your word for it. Plus, every time Craig has a sales figure, he applies it to a modern sales figure, right, by using some calculus that he has in his head that I don't, which is very interesting. So 50,000 copies which then is what today. It would be about the equivalent of half a million copies today. And really, that understates things, because books are a lot harder to print and a lot harder to distribute in that and time period. And they're read, read by more people in the 19th century in a family or a community than now. Absolutely. I mean, Lincoln's life I is don't lend books, so no one is getting this one. People don't lend books the way they used to and circulate them. Right, but I mean, Lincoln's life is an example of he, the books he had to read were lent to him because his family couldn't afford them. So right. his book was, was the same way. And I, I looked at lots of newspaper coverage from 1860, which is where I got these new figures and these new reports of when the book came out and the kind of impact it made. And it was everywhere. There, were, there was a newspaper that said, this book should be in the hands of every voter. And honestly, when you read the coverage, it felt like it was. It was just essential. I mean, pe people have not given this book enough attention, but it, it was so important to presenting his ideas, and he knew that. He, he wasn't going to get credit for it. He wasn't, you know, it wasn't like, oh, Abraham Lincoln is an author, and thus he's a great political candidate. He couldn't get the credit for it, but he knew his ideas mattered, and he knew books could change, change the world, yeah. and that's why he did it. No, you do a great job of, of presenting it, and at the same time, he's also writing out his two versions of his own autobiography, which he's then feeding to to professionals to write as if he had no involvement. So one of his collaborators, interestingly, was William Dean Howells, which is pretty fancy stuff for 1860. So um, Lincoln gave an exemption to um, serve in the Union Army to Theodore Roosevelt's father, or we might not have had Theodore Roosevelt. Um, he was absolved from the military draft. Theodore is born. 
Young Theodore watches Lincoln's funeral. Everything is connected. There's a continuum. And now we have Teddy, so Eleanor's uncle Teddy, who is quite the literary man. I mean, you give a lot of attention to his naval history of 1812, which was a triumph of scholarship and still consulted by people who write about the War of 1812. So Teddy is a different kind of guy. He's a professional writer, and he is a just reads everything. What does he read, a book a day, even when he's president, and um, writes a book a week or whatever? <laughs> Tell us about his... I mean, he's a writer, in a sense, before he's a politician. That's absolutely right. Uh, one of the editors he worked with after Roosevelt passed away tried to do the numbers, tried to estimate, you know, well, how many letters, how many books... And he came up with millions of words, which means that, that Roosevelt had the equivalent of a very robust literary professional career, not even counting all the political stuff and, and all the military stuff on the side. So it's, it's amazing his ability to focus. Um, I do think his literary career would probably have been a little bit more lasting if he had been a little bit more patient. But sometimes he was writing because he needed money. Um, that said, that the reason I focused on that first book is I, I feel like it was the book he was the most passionate about. And it was the book where he really articulated some interesting ideas that if you look at his political career, you can see him sort of moving away from. So, so this book is about the naval side of the War of 1812. And he gets the idea while he's an undergraduate student at Harvard. And it's just, he falls in love with this idea. He's sitting in classrooms, not paying attention to the lectures, but just daydreaming about naval conflicts. And he gets out and he draws maps of how the ships would interact. And he studies wind patterns and he studies water patterns. And he wants to get these tiny little details exactly right. He goes to archives that no historian had consulted. And this is as a 21 year old, 22 year old, to get the information. You, you didn't do that till you were 24 or five. Exactly, right? yeah, 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 yeah. Waited. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and so he cares about this, and what he does with this raw information is he uses it to sort of debunk some ideas about heroism and, and patriotism. And the example I talk about in my book is Oliver Perry, who's a famous admiral and won a battle. And the story at that time was that this was a great underdog victory where Perry was just such an American hero and such a patriot that he and his you know, ragtag group of, of sailors were able to win the battle. Perry was a huge figure. I mean, it wasn't just that ships were being named after him, towns were being named after him. But Roosevelt very thoroughly debunked this, this mythology. He did, did the analysis and did things like said, you know, okay, let's look at how many cannons each ship has. Let's look how those cannons were made. And then let's look what direction those cannons are pointing. Because if you have 20 cannons on a ship, but only eight of them are pointing in one direction, then really you only have eight cannons you can use. So that's the kind of specificity that Roosevelt was doing, and, and he was the first person to do it on these conflicts. And so all that work led him to a simple conclusion. Uh, Perry won not because he was braver than the British soldiers or, or, or more of a patriot or because of the flag on the top of his ship. He won because he had better resources. And so it's, it's such a, I mean, it's an important historical lesson and, and, you know, to let the facts lead you. But it's also so interesting to think in terms of Roosevelt's own political journey because by the time he runs for president or becomes president, he, I mean, he did as much as, as anyone to sort of create the modern presidency we know today where the, the president is, you know, the defining figure in our national imagination. He did that through ideas like bluster and patriotism and heroism. I mean, that's, that's what made Teddy Roosevelt Teddy Roosevelt. So it's so interesting to see in his first book that he was sort of saying, those ideas aren't enough. Sometimes you have to think about things like how many cannons are pointing in one direction. But by the end, th those ideas and ideals were what he needed. And so you're less kind about his legacy book. Um, his autobiography, you say that um, it was self-confident but not self-aware. And um, you even say it was surly. So what's, what's, um, what happens to him? Is he just too rushed? Is he too tired? Is he too dejected? Is it not written for the joy of writing? Or as you say, he's not at his strongest when he's writing about his really favorite subject, which is himself. But the autobiography is not, you don't consider it a great contribution to this archive. I'm hard on it, but Teddy Roosevelt was even harder on it. In his letters, he talks about, I fairly loathe this thing that I'm working on. Like that, That's a direct quote. That's how he described his own work. And I think all the factors you mentioned play into it, that he was tired, that he had just had an exhausting and dispiriting run for the presidency again. And I, I'm not sure that he wanted to write it. An editor at a magazine really sort of convinced him this is worth doing. 
And, and the early parts on Roosevelt's childhood are, are wonderful. And that editor sat down with him and had a stenographer, like the person recording the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And that editor would just ask questions and say, you know, well, 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 slow down a little bit. Why don't you tell me a little bit more about your parents? Or, or well, you were outside so much. Why, why did that matter to you? And those questions really caused Roosevelt to slow down and open up. And, and the first chapters in the book are, are really wonderful. There's, there's another chapter later in the book I really like where he talks about how loving the outdoors and loving books are not a Opposed. We kind of think sometimes that, you know, I'm an outdoorsy person or I'm a bookish person. But Roosevelt said in their highest form, they complement each other. But the political chapters were the ones that gave him trouble because that's when he would really get surly. And I stand by it. Um, he would really get surly and, and, and just try to, try to pick fights and, and win arguments instead of focusing on that kind of personal material that makes the best parts of the book sing. So we get to Wilson, our first professional academic president, I guess, a southerner in New Jersey clothing. Um, so he writes one book of pretty strong reputation, right, Congressional Government, and then he writes his ambitious History of the American People, which perhaps does not have um, as strong a, 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 as a reputation. In fact, when I was doing research for my last book, I found um, a number of groups within the Democratic Party who took offense at history of the American people. Immigrant, uh, immigrants, um, foreign language newspapers, African American newspapers all had harsh things to say. But he can't help himself either. I mean, and he keeps writing. How does, how does his writing come to be a part of the campaign in 1912? You've got two writers plus a judge running against each other, and the two writers get the most votes. That doesn't usually amount, doesn't usually account to a big plus. I'm a, I'm a published historian, but that's what they were. That's absolutely right. And what's really interesting is that, is that those two writers are, again, the figures who did as much to expand the presidency into, into its modern and robust form of anybody in that period. So um, Wilson's books and Roosevelt's books came up a lot on the campaign trail. And so they were both attacked. Um, my favorite example between the two is actually from Roosevelt, where he wrote about um, being in Cuba and, and fighting in the Spanish-American War. And he wrote about um, African-American soldiers and that they weren't as resilient and tough. And I mean, he was relying on the same kind of degrading stereotypes that Thomas Jefferson had relied on, um, but that, that story haunted him. And so Roosevelt, you know, people who found that offensive called Roosevelt on it and brought it up. And, you know, maybe some of them were motivated by wanting a political attack, but maybe some of them really felt it. And what I'll, what I'll always remember is finding an old newspaper clip where Roosevelt responds to this, and he just says, oh, they're trying to make a mountain out of a molehill. And that just felt so modern in a sense. Yeah. Like you could see, you know, somebody on Twitter finding an example of a candidate's book and bringing it up and the candidate just trying to dismiss it. But Roosevelt was doing it in 1912. Wilson was doing it the same way. So you say that you, the biggest surprise in your research came when you found that history had kind of underestimated the Lincoln-Douglas debate scrapbook or at least not considered it among this, this treasury uh, of, of campaign books. For me, the biggest surprise was reading about Calvin Coolidge. Um, and it's a great section of the book. For, zo for those of you who think he was indeed nothing but silent Cal, well, he wrote a pretty influential book before, and he wrote an important legacy book after. And as you portray it, it touches nearly 80 years of history, because as you pointed out in the beginning, Reagan read it. But this is my favorite story in the book, so I'm not going to tell it. I'm going to let you tell it. Tell us about the man who, who reads the book. Oh, sure, sure. I don't even want to do the setup yeah. line in public. So we're talking about Calvin Coolidge's campaign book. And so if people think about Calvin Coolidge, and, and I understand most of you have not spent 10 years thinking about Calvin Coolidge, and <laughs> that's why I wrote this for you, so you don't have to. We have had Amity Schles here, so she spent time there you go. Yeah. thinking about her biography is Yeah, her biography is a wonderful work. Um, but when Coolidge decides to run, it's not his silence that helps him, it's his words. He was a fantastic writer, and, and this was noted in the time. When he was in the White House, the New York Times wrote a story about him and said he's the best writer since Lincoln to be in the White House. And I actually found a letter where Coolidge wrote to that writer, even when he's president, has so much to, to worry about, and just says thank you, because he, it, it meant a lot to him to be recognized for his prose. So anyway, this happens 
pretty much from his time as lieutenant governor and, and even as the head of the state senate in Massachusetts. He writes really good speeches. And he, he just has a gift that sort of lines up with his political appeal. And that those are always the times in history when these books can really work, when the style and the, and the ideas and the character all kind of fuse. And so he was, he was somebody who really wanted to, to defend a traditional idea of America. And he had this kind of clipped, um, quiet style that he would write with. And so he had these speeches, and his supporters gathered them as a book. Now, in public, Coolidge said, I don't want anything to do with this. In private, he was arguing about commas with his editor, because, I mean, that's what you have. And, and again, you see that human side. He was a writer, and he really cared about, about his writing. But this book comes out, and it, it really was his campaign when he ran, ran for president, because he was somebody who held on to that old ideal of you don't go out and, and publicly campaign. So his book was distributed. And this oh. is called Have Faith in Massachusetts. Thank you. Yeah, have right. a line from one of his speeches. Um, and his editor came up with that title. He, there, were, there were other much worse titles. His editor found that line in the speech, and it, it, I think that really helped. And just the context is this is 1920, and Coolidge wants to be nominated for president. Mm -hmm. He's not. Warren Harding is, but then tell us a story about what happens, and it's related, of course, to the book. Right, so the, the book is everywhere. About 70,000 copies get sold or distributed. Even as late as at the convention, Coolidge's supporters are passing out copies of the book, and one of them hands a copy to somebody and says, I, you know, th this book shows why he should be president. It's Herbert Hoover, <laughs> who himself is kind of being considered as a potential contender. I don't know if Hoover read the book or not, but. Um, so, Coolidge does not get, he's on the ballot for a couple times, but you know, it's, it's a famously a very long convention, a very sweaty convention. They're, they're there, they're tired, they're out of alcohol thanks to the prohibition, and everybody's ready to go home. And so finally Warren Harding is chosen as a kind of compromise candidate, and the last thing to do before everybody can get out of town is to pick the vice president. And so the, the party um, influencers are sort of trying to push for this specific senator. But when they call on somebody thinking that he's gonna nominate or second that senator, instead he gets up and gives a speech about why Calvin Coolidge would be the perfect vice president. And I found old interviews with him and also letters Coolidge sent him after the fact that are just so amazing because he, he'd never met Calvin Coolidge, but he received three different copies of his book and then a friend tried to lend him another copy because for Coolidge, the book was the campaign and the book really captured everything that, that he wanted to do. and so. This person said, you know, when I read Coolidge's speeches, I fell in love with the person, I fell in love with the politician. And in, in a very real sense, without that book, Calvin Coolidge wouldn't have had the national notoriety, but also wouldn't have had the connection with that specific voter. That book was a conduit, a way for Coolidge and that person to have a kind of conversation. And that's what inspired this person to nominate him. He becomes vice president and then later president. All from the book. That's why candidates keep writing books for the delegate who will change history, the delegate slash reader. So um, I'm gonna pass o mercifully pass over Hoover, except to, to, who wrote, what, 30 books, you say? A lot of books. <laughs> but I love one thing that Craig writes um, about one book he, he put out in 1934 called Challenge to Liberty. And he, uh, uh, in, as Craig puts it, Hoover perceives the three great challenges to liberty to be fascism, communism, and Franklin Roosevelt. So, <laughs> so what can we say about Roosevelt? Um, we have to say something in his house. He was a good editor. I mean, he changed a day. He changed the text of his uh, post Pearl Harbor speech to say a day which will live in infamy. Um, he was smart enough to hire Robert Sherwood, a Pulitzer Prize winner, to be a speechwriter. So my favorite. Roosevelt story you tell is the, um, is it Morris Ernst, the publicity stunt that changes publishers' postal rates in, uh, tell that story because Roosevelt does make a great contribution to American publishing. I think that this move actually may have saved American publishing in the Depression. I mean, he saved a lot of industries and, and workers and, uh, but this is, this is one I didn't know. And it, it's absolutely a story that sort of gets at how the presidency is changing and how the book industry is changing and so many other things. Um, so in the 1930s and the 1940s, it's, it costs a lot more money to mail a book than to mail a magazine. And the reason for that is that publishers, God love them, they're, they're just not as capitalist as the magazine people. And so the magazine people have lobbyists, they, they go to Washington, they try to get the best rate, they know how to play politics. 
book publishers, and I should be careful because my editor and a lot of the people from my publishing house are here tonight, but book publishers... They're not mailing as many books as they used to. That's so true. Like uh, but book publishers are not as, not as focused on maybe playing politics. And so they have to pay higher postage rates, which affects readers. And so finally, they consult with Mr. Ernst that you mentioned, who, who is a lobbyist, who does know how to play politics. And he and comes up- a friend up, of FDR's. Right. And he comes up with a stunt to, get, to make this problem, which it seems abstract, right? Postage rates, who cares about that? He finds a way to make it funny and concrete. He sends two packages to FDR at the White House. They weigh the exact same. One is a, co is a package of books, including Shakespeare and the Bible. The other is a package of dirty magazines. <laughs> Seriously. And the dirty magazines are much cheaper to ship. And so, I mean, that right there is, is the argument. You know, should we really be subsidizing things that aren't serious literature and not taking care of our book publishers who distribute the kinds of books that, that are so essential to, to being an American and, and being a participant in democracy? And the argument worked for FDR. He changed the rules as an executive while he waited for Congress to kind of ch catch up and, and pass legislation. See, he reacted to socialism for the rich. Where have we heard that phrase before? Um, that's a great story, and I think it's underappreciated. Thank you for finding it and, and sharing it in the book. Uh, you do a great job with Harry Truman. Very realistic job, too, because it, it's, a, it's a wonderful story about all the money he got, all the work he did, all the money he blew on this project, um, the technique that he created. I, I felt so good for him about the big book signing you talked about and all the attention he got and how happy he was. Because I, I have an affection for Truman, whatever his flaws. But as you point out, it didn't really improve his popularity rating at the time. Did he, what did he get, $600,000 for this? Right, which is the equivalent of, I think, about $6 million in today's figures. So there he goes again with he, the computer. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's good. Uh, well, it, you know, it's a huge sum of money, but he, he made very little he, off of it because he created kind of a small bureaucracy to document the bureaucracy of the presidency. And, and he has no pension, by the way. He has no Secret Service. He's the last president to have neither, although he gets a pension later when there are right. pensions. Right, and so despite that 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 lack of that lack of resources, um, he gets the money for the book, and but he doesn't worry about you know how much is this book going to cost, how long is it going to take. He he felt and he said again and again, he's history has given me so much, I owe something to history, and it, it's a simple thing to say, but I find it really moving to see it in action. And he spent so much time getting his memories down and getting the memories of his staffers. He would have people from his cabinet come to Kansas City and he would have discussions with them while the ghostwriter was in the room and while somebody was in the room recording it. And so they produced more than two million words for this book, way more than they could print. And Harry Truman rev reviewed every one of them, reviewed every comma, because he wanted to get things exactly right and he wanted to tell his side of the story. And so it, it's a really interesting behind the scenes story. Even th the book has some wonderful passages in it and I, I quote actually the one of FDR's passing and Harry Truman sort of talking about this Very is what I felt like. famous uh, right. passage, yeah. Right, and so that there are wonderful examples in the book. The book itself maybe doesn't hold up as well as it should, but but that process, that that patriotic commitment of Truman to say, I, I have to get down everything that I saw. It made a difference because there are letters and diary entries from his family that are only preserved because of the work they did on the memoirs. And there are all these millions of words that he approved that we know this is exactly how Harry Truman saw history. And so, yes, his book didn't save his reputation, but he created this archive of tens of thousands of pages that people like David McCullough or people like me could draw on. So and David McCullough did change his reputation. Right, ultimately. that was the book that did it, for sure. Yeah. And so I, I think that you know Harry Truman didn't write the book that would necessarily serve history, but his just his work ethic and his passion created an archive that could serve history better than anything any, else, any other president has done. And, I think it's a fitting tribute to him and, and his life as a reader and, and a public servant. He also did a series of TV documentaries at some point, which I remember watching with my father. He was the first person to say son of a bitch on television. <laughs> guess who can guess who he was speaking about? MacArthur. Absolutely. It was MacArthur. Um, so I guess the most famous of all pre-presidential campaign books uh, I guess the title still belongs to uh, John Kennedy. And you, you devote a lot of time to dissecting the authorship and the Pulitzer Prize campaign for Profiles in Courage. 
and your conclusion uh, will not please Kennedy aficionados, um, who are still back and forth on how much Kennedy in his, um, after back surgery, really contributed to this effort. Um, and your conclusion is very little, right? That's right. I, I, I kept thinking to myself when I did a book event at Harvard Bookstore in Cambridge that I might need a security detail. <laughs> uh, but thankfully, everyone was really gracious, um, although a couple people after the, the event definitely quizzed me uh, about this question. Um, See, I think the worst thing about the book was the celebrate. I mean, in a way, it shows someone's lack of historical understanding, but was the celebration of Edmund Ross, the senator who cast the deciding vote that acquitted Andrew Johnson in the impeachment trial, who is Kennedy, quote, Kennedy portrays as a noble senator who couldn't be bought, but in fact he was bought off for that vote. Anyway, we'll leave, that's my observation on Profiles and Courage. But tell us more about how little he did on, sure. the, on the book. Sure, it, it, it was a flawed history book, but it, but it wasn't his history book. It was really Ted Sorensen who did the work. And, and I'll give Ted Sorensen a little, cut him a little slack actually, because he had to produce the first draft of this book in a month while he had a young child and a wife who was seven or eight months pregnant. And so despite all those demands on his time, he was working seven days a week to, to produce this book and, and to read all the research and to write the first drafts. And so I, I do take some time to sort of walk through exactly what we can know and what we can't know, um, because I think it's important and it tells us something about Kennedy himself. It doesn't bother me that the book is ghostwritten. I think, you know, if we're gonna attack ghostwriting, we have to start with George Washington's farewell address, which has a whole lot of Alexander Hamilton and a whole lot of James Madison in it. Um, ghostwriting is not a problem, I don't think, as long as the president authorizes, you know, their words and, and stands by their words and is involved. It, it's a fine process that can help somebody like a George Washington produce prose that you know is still kind of a foundational text today. The problem is when you want a Pulitzer for ghostwriting. And, and one of the things I show in my book for the first time with documents I found at the Kennedy Library is that when Kennedy won the Pulitzer Prize for his book, this wasn't something his dad provided him. Um, this was something that Kennedy was directly involved with himself. So this JFK is a senator. He's got a lot to worry about, but he is still working behind the scenes to secure himself a Pulitzer Prize for a book that he had very little to deal to do with. And I think that tells you something about him as a person. And he did not make the finalist list, but he won the prize, which is rather unique. But his father had something to that's do a with it. That's a nice way to put it. Yeah. I mean, his father worked with Arthur Crock, the newspaper man, to reopen the, the jury. Anyway, no one ever found out about it, really, during the campaign. He was worried, right? Well, it, it did come out in 1957. Oh, that's right. There was the television interview. Right. But then the family was very effective, and Kennedy himself was very effective in, in tamping down this rumor. He honestly worked much harder on the promotion of the book than he did on, on the actual book itself. There was a certain point in the book where you say, you speculate, because you can't say for sure, that Kennedy ultimately was at this marketing so much that he might have convinced himself that he actually wrote the book. It's very hard to say. It's, it's difficult to understand exactly what he was thinking, um, but I mean, the paper trail is as clear as it could be, and that's that, I mean, the other thing that you need to keep in mind is that this book was already a hit. The, it's not like the Pulitzer Prize made the book famous, right. which then helped it him become president. In 1956, um, before the Pulitzer Prize, he's on the short list and, and nearly wins the vice presidency. He runs into Harry Truman at the Democratic Convention, and at that convention, the reporters are like, oh my goodness, what did you guys talk about? They talked about Profiles in Courage, which tells you that Truman's a great reader, but it also tells you that that book was everywhere. And so the book was already a fantastic success, and, and it would have been a happy story if Kennedy was fine with just having an enormously best-selling ghostwritten book. But he wanted more. He wanted literary fame. And well, I, you I'm quote not him as sure saying why. the Pulitzer, he, we wanted the Pulitzer more than the presidency, which is probably ridiculous, but he apparently said it to someone. I mean, he said it to, to a Pulitzer Prize winning historian, and I, I trust her memory. She's, she's a very credible source. And it's not the only time that, that he brought up the Pulitzer before or after. He just, for some reason, he wanted it. He just didn't want to do the work to get it. Yeah. Or he was also, he was also sick. I mean, he was incapacitated. It's, I'll just tell you a very quick Sorensen story. So I did a program with Ted Sorensen at the New York Times once, and it was about Lincoln and Kennedy. So at the end, a New York, it was four New York Times reporters. A reporter said, Mr. Sorensen, it's 2007. Please tell us, once and for all, can you not share with us who wrote President Kennedy's inaugural address? And Sorensen looked out and said, ask not. <laughs> he never broke 
silence. Uh, he never <laughs> confided about profiles. If you look at his book, his loyalty is amazing. His and loyalty was what's awesome. really interesting is that the best defense they had when this scandal flared up was a statement where uh, Sorensen talked in front of an swore an affidavit in front of a notary where he said. I had very little to do with the book, and what I did do was graciously acknowledged in the preface. What I found by looking at the papers at the Kennedy Pre Presidential Library is that the first draft of that preface did not mention Sorensen at all. That's, that's the one part right. of the book we know that Kennedy wrote, and he didn't even give the person who wrote the book credit. <laughs> so Sorensen, I mean, it's, it, it's hard to wrap your head around. Sorensen gives him credit, or Sorensen says, you know, maybe you should at least mention me. Kennedy mentions him in the second draft, and then that slight mention that Sorensen had to beg to put in there becomes the fulcrum for the defense that Kennedy actually wrote yeah. the book. So I knew this was going to happen, that we'd be 60 years short here, but I just, I want to give some bon mot from this book, and then I'll ask Go you about, about the, the ending. I mean, things I didn't know, that Kennedy may have inspired Nixon to write... Um, uh, six Crises by talking about, well, you should write a book. That was a mistake. Um, Nixon's um, memoirs were, uh, post-presidential memoirs were greeted by people carrying signs that said, don't buy a book from a crook. I didn't know that. I didn't remember that. Um, Craig talks about Jimmy Carter still writing books. He's now outlived his 87-year-old editor. Um, and he's at work. His will be one of the four final books from Alice Mayhew at Simon & Schuster that she signed and, and was working on. So he's written a ton of books. Um, Craig speaks uh, authoritatively and very amusingly about Ronald Reagan, um, who joked at a marketing event for his memoir, An American Life. Uh, I hear it's a great book. One of these days I'm going to read it myself. But as you point out, he was not a bad writer, and he... Yeah, his first book, Where's the Rest of Me, came out in 1965 and was a really important book, not just to help him win the gubernatorial race in California, but if you go behind the scenes, you can see how carefully Reagan defined this kind of sunny political image and how he found, you know, whatever you think of his ideas, he found a way to make those ideas appeal to lots of people. And that, that wasn't political consultants that did that. That, that was Reagan, and, and the proof is right there in that book. Yeah. I also think that finding his diaries was as illuminating as hearing the Nixon tapes, because this man sat and wrote in a diary every day of his presidency and actually was was pretty extraordinary at summing up his day through his through the lens of his of his viewpoint of course it was great stuff about bill clinton somehow getting a thousand page book together i think he brought it in at 998 or something he didn't want it to be a thousand pages and um, i wanted to end with the president who originally inspired you as as you say and that's barack obama who maybe um, wrote still the most influential maybe with profiles in a way, the most influential pr campaign book, and we've yet to hear from him on the legacy book. Um, Michelle Obama's is probably the best, certainly the best-selling first lady's memoir in, the, in publishing history. Um, um, and, um, but Obama, he had a bestseller with Dreams for My Father nine years after he wrote it. So talk us through Dreams for My Father, certainly. Sure. It's... It's easy to imagine Obama, you know, telling his polished life story. He talks about, you know, my father was from Kenya, my mother was from Kansas, and that he does that in the convention speech in 2004. He certainly did it a lot when he was running for president. And, and that life story, I think, was inspirational and kind of set up his, his call for unity, for working together, sort of the, the, the key ideas in his campaign. I mentioned when talking about Coolidge, where if you can have the style and the life and the beliefs all line up, that's a very powerful package. And that was certainly true for Obama, too. But, but what I try to do in my chapter is say, let's, let's not think about the polished um, you know, version of Obama. Let's think about where that story came from. And although it seems like a story that just intuitively makes sense, he had to write it first. And, and it was really in the writing of his book in the early 1990s when nobody knew who he was or cared who he was that he was able to figure out that life story that ultimately became his most powerful asset when he ran for president. And it wasn't an easy story to write. He lost his first book deal. Um, because he turned in pages and they just weren't good enough because he was really struggling with, well, well, what does my personal story mean? How do I connect this to bigger ideas? But he didn't stop there. He, he kept writing. Crucially, he kept reading. He was somebody who really read um, literary memoir, which is, is a genre that I think really shaped dreams from my father and, and helped give him that kind of soaring um, rhetoric that, that he used as a candidate as well. 
And so he eventually got the book together. It did not sell very well. Um, you know, he, he went on a small book tour, did the best he could to promote it, but the book kind of fell out of print. But what I love is that the book always meant something to him. There, there's a, a famous story, a famous trip, when after he becomes state senator, he starts touring downstate southern Illinois. And, and Obama and the people around him would later say, you know, this was when he realized he could connect with voters from rural white America. And this was when he started to realize that he was a special kind of politician. It's, it, it's a great trip, but when I talked to people who were on that trip with him, they told me something that I'd never seen before, which is that he took copies of his out-of-print book with him. And if he really connected with a voter, he would give them a copy of that book. They, they couldn't buy it in a bookstore. It was completely out of print. Nobody cared, but he still cared. And the fact that he gave those books to people as just kind of a way to say, you know, this is who I am, that thank you for connecting with me, I think that tells you a lot about him as a reader and a writer. And how many copies did it sell after his keynote address? A lot. Uh, a lot. The, the combined sales for that and Audacity by the time he entered the White House were six million copies. I'm not going to adjust that for population because that's a big enough number by itself. Well, that's pretty big. It's, it, it was an extraordinary way to end the book because it was both different because Obama has genuine literary um, aspirations and he had a literary background, hung out in bookstores, took literature courses, and, and go back to Jefferson who was an extraordinary writer and the continuum is amazing. So Craig has really... Um, given us a new way to look at the presidency and the new, a new way to look at the art of communications. And even in the Twitter age, books are still important. Um, just ask, just think about Our Revolution by Bernie or Promises to Keep by Joe Biden. Maybe not as popular, and maybe there's a reason for that. Uh, the Shortest Way Home by Pete Buttigieg. And there's always Bloomberg by Bloomberg, for those of you who are really <laughs> curious. But let's hear from you. We have time for some questions. Just wait for the microphone. Trudy, do you have a question? Wait, wait for the mic. Um, in what category would you put Jimmy Carter, who was probably the most prolific of our, I think, I don't know, maybe he isn't. I, I know I got a lot of books from him <laughs> and by him. Um, but in what category would you place him, or is he in a category by himself? Thank, thank you for your question. Um, it's him or Teddy Roosevelt for most prolific uh, president. They're they're right there, and and I think and I hope that President Carter lives long enough to surpass him and, and claim that for himself. Um, but what's interesting is that he kind of transcends all the categories we've been talking about. He had a campaign book called Why Not the Best, which not many people think of today, but it sold 300,000 copies when he ran for president. And there are great stories about Norman Mailer profiling this this upstart presidential candidate, and and the reason that Mailer was interested in this guy was a book. And he was like, this is, this is not your average political book. This is a real book. And so that book really helped Carter, and he just kept working on them after. And he, I mean, he's written a children's book. He's written a, a novel. He's written all kinds of memoirs. Religious books? Religious books. book about his mother? Right. right. Um, my favorite book of his is called An Hour Before Daylight. And it's, it's a short book, and it, it, it's just a, a, an achingly personal book. It's, he really tones down the style and just writes about growing up in the South. And, and there's some passages in Why Not the Best that also talk about his upbringing, but they're even better in this version. And he just talks about, you know, what was it like to grow up in the South? And, and I remember reading that book while I was working on mine, and, and so many things that I tried to draw out, those kinds of digressions you mentioned, like the Sears Roebuck catalog or Al Jolson, the actor, they were there in Carter's story. And so it was just such a nice reminder that, that Carter's life and, and his uh, all-American childhood were, were really connecting to some of the other things that I'd already mentioned in the book. And, and it shows how important um, books had been to somebody like him and, and how important his books have been to, to many of his supporters as well. Yes, right here. Sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Furman, for the wonderful presentation. When you were talking about President Kennedy and uh, the book Profiles in Courage, and you said when he was going after the Pulitzer Prize, that showed something about him, and you elaborated a little bit, but I, I still didn't get what you meant. What do you think it did show about him? Sure. No, I, I, um, I appreciate you saying that. I, I, I'll, I'll tell you a story about a reader. How about that? I, I'll still, I still won't say what I think, but I'll tell you what somebody else thought. 
in, in my book, I sometimes try to tell stories of regular readers, and that, you know, a school teacher who was in the same county as Thomas Jefferson, somebody who lived in New York City when Abraham Lincoln was growing up. I, these stories matter to me because all the, all the digressions you talked about, I, I, one thing I hope this book does is tell serious readers, people like you, the history of yourself, to sort of know, like, you know, if I had been alive when Abraham Lincoln was president, where would I have gotten books? What kind of books would I like to read? I, I really try to answer those questions because readers are the reason that presidential books have been so popular. The reason that they sell well is because readers care about democracy and care about ideas and, and care about leaders. So there was a, a regular reader that I talk about in, in the Kennedy chapter who was somebody who wrote a book himself. And he was a school teacher. He headed up the student government at his small school in Kansas. He was everything that any of us would have wanted in, in, a, in a kind of um, social science teacher in high school. He cared about books. He cared about America. He was a very patriotic person. And on the side, he actually worked on this book about Woodrow Wilson that wasn't a great original interpretation of Wilson, but it had a lot of material because this person worked hard. And so he wrote Kennedy and, and just said, you know, I've heard this stuff about the ghostwriting, but that wouldn't be true, right? You, you wouldn't have accepted that award if you hadn't done the work. I, I'm gonna assign this book to my students. Tell me, tell me that this isn't true. And I, I mean, I think that really boils it down, that if Kennedy wanted an award, but wasn't willing to do the work for the award, what does that say about his character? That, that was something, character came up a lot in the story for this book because people would say, you know, oh, he worked on this while he had back surgery, he, had, he was having such a terrible time, which is true. But during all this, he still worked on this book and it tells you a lot about his character. But I think the real story of the book tells you a lot about Kennedy's character too. And it, it's not a complicated issue. It's, is it the right thing to do to take a Pulitzer Prize for a book that you didn't work on? I, I, I don't think that that reveals good character, I guess. I said I wasn't going to say, and then I said. <laughs> Sorry. But I appreciate your question, but, the chance to clarify. But you, you set it up nicely, elaborately. <laughs> yes, right here. I'm sorry, I'll get to the site. Uh, I've been thinking about Bolton and the publishing and the holdup, and I was wondering two parts. Uh, do presidents have to submit their books for clearance, uh, on secret clearance, number one, and two, do you know, historically, has there been an instance where any presidential book or any book has been held up for political reasons? That's a good question. It is a really good question. Yes, there is that review process that you're talking about, and, and Bolton's book is caught up in it. What's really interesting is there was the talk of even more stringent reviews. When Carter was president, he actually tried to um, institute a new policy where people could not sell their memoirs after the uh, after they left the administration, um, but he couldn't he couldn't get it through because of First Amendment issues. I just I just I mean even if you think that it's a good idea that they shouldn't sell their life stories, I can't think of a way legally that that would hold up in the courts to kind of prevent that, other than the review process that we're talking about. Um, I don't know of any examples uh, of a president that you're. That, that would speak to what you're saying, but what, what I would add, and I think the Bolton story makes this really clear, is that this is just all so new. It's, it, it really started in terms of just the huge dollar figures in the 1980s, and, and that had to do with changes to publishing as much as anything else. I call it blockbuster publishing in my book. And so this happened so fast that books by people who left the Reagan administration actually made it to bookstores faster than some books by people from the Carter administration, the previous administration. They lapped them because all of a sudden there was this new emphasis on speed, on money, on gossip. And so that's the world we're still living in today in terms of political publishing, but that's, you know, that's not that long ago. And so I think there are still kind of the questions we were talking about with Kennedy. There are ethical and moral questions about, you know, when you share your story, whether you should profit from your story. And uh, I think the Bolton case shows that, that as, as a country, we haven't really solved those issues yet. Exactly, the First Amendment context is very important. Magda, can you make it down here? Wait, wait for the mic, though. Yes, you. Good. Thank you. Can you tell us what the hardest part was for you writing the book? I think the hardest part was was the digressions, and so that's why the fact that you said that that those worked for you and that the, that those those asides made the story feel more exciting and and not distracting was 
because I it took a you know I I really tried to find examples that could go from one chapter to another. So somebody shows up a publisher who Thomas Jefferson is writing letters to, and then in the next chapter, all of a sudden he's hiring somebody to um, sell books out of a wagon, and then in the next chapter, Andrew Jackson is writing him letters, and so I. I Th this book really tells a story, and, and it really is an untold story. And so for me, finding the right digressions and finding a way to capture the way that, you know, one book would influence another book, one president would read another president, but they also depended on a lot of stuff outside of them, like bookstores and publishers, that, that was the tricky part for me. And, and it, you know, I, I found a lot of fun publishing trivia that I did not put in the book uh, because it didn't connect to that story, but I, I really wanted it to tell a story, and I hope it does. Thank you. Let's do one more. Yes, here. We'd like to make it hard for Magda to race through the room. <laughs> Sorry about that. One president you didn't mention was Eisenhower. Did he do any publishing after he left office? And by the way, it's it's I who didn't mention him. Craig mentions him. So let Tell, sure. Do tell the story. Yeah, no, I, I'm really glad you brought him up. He, he published before the White House and after. His Crusade from Europe is was a fantastic book, really well written. I mean, you can compare it to, to Grant's personal memoirs about the Civil War. This was Eisenhower's book about World War II, and so it's, it's a wonderful book, and it was a huge seller, and I think it did a lot to help him sort of tell his story in a way that positioned him to run for office. And then he did do presidential memoirs as well, which he got a big advance for. Interestingly, uh, Harry Truman helped Eisenhower get a tax break. Um, it, it's, it's a very complicated story. I, it's one of those digressions I stuck in the end notes, but um, he helped him get a tax break for this big blockbuster advance he got for, for a crusade from Europe. Once Eisenhower was president and Harry Truman has his memoirs, Truman says, you know, how about returning the favor? It, it, it's a difference of like, you know, a 30% tax bracket versus a 70% tax bracket. It's a lot of money. There's no record of Eisenhower ever helping him or, or doing anything to reciprocate the favor. But that, all that to say, Eisenhower did work on his presidential memoirs, and, and he wrote a book after, the, after the, those um, called At Ease, Stories I Tell My Friends. And it, it's a lot like that Jimmy Carter book, um, An Hour Before Daylight. It's just a very personal and conversational book. And in the end of my book, I actually have a little appendix that, that I kind of think of as a reader's guide, and I tried to make it really practical. So it says, you know, buy this edition of Thomas Jefferson and, and look at this page number, and you'll not just get notes on the state of Virginia, you'll get Jefferson's autobiography too. And so I mentioned some of these other books too, and, and so if, you know, I hope that people who finish my book are, are excited to read another book, because I, I think this book is a love letter to reading and to how important reading has been in American history, and whether it's that last Eisenhower book or, or any of the other ones I mentioned in the appendix, it's, you know, hopefully this is a book that, especially in an election year, it could give people a, a, an impetus to, to read a lot of serious books and, and think hard about what we want to be as, as a country. Well, this has been an extraordinary evening. It's a wonderful book. Craig didn't mention The Art of the Deal once. Uh, um, you can ask him about it upstairs. Um, but um, not only have you given us a food for thought about future reading and, and what we demand of our candidates and what we expect in their legacy books, but you've given us some very fine writing and very fine history. So please join me in thanking Craig Crump. <laughs>